thank you very much for having me here. It's, um, it's, always, a, it's always a great pleasure to, to be among like minds. And I think um, to, to make, um, to, I guess to coach my experience a little more accurately, I think I'm making discoveries or working on areas that you guys are working on. Whether I can inform you or you can inform me is probably remains to be seen, but I think it's, uh, it's really interesting that um, the, these, these kinds of things are being worked on uh, right now and that we have uh, ways that we can probably help each other. So hopefully I'll give you a good sense, a rounded sense of, of what we're doing. Um, and for those of you who might not be so familiar with science museums, um, the idea is to create interactive experiences that engage audiences in STEM ideas, so science, math, tech, engineering, and technology ideas. And um, those, the idea of engagement means you're not necessarily giving people um, uh, dinosaur bones to look at, but you're giving them ideas that they can actually interact with and learn something about. And we don't necessarily try to teach specific curriculum concepts, but we, what we do is we try to get people to have sort of a spark of an idea. It's like if something really interests them, that they can figure out a way to pursue it further. Um, we think we've, we've achieved something if we manage to, to accomplish that. Our audiences are typically, well, our audiences are pre-K to adult, but um, they center around middle school and upper elementary school. So one of the, the uh, challenges that we face is how do we make ideas understandable to people who have emergent adult um, uh, cognition? Um, they're not all adult cognition learners. They're, some of them are not quite there yet. So you know, an eight-year-old is very different from a 13-year-old, and we have to be conscious of that, and we have to have our experiences be scalable um, among those cognitive levels. So, um, well, you'll, you'll understand why, the, why this is called the fourth paradigm in a few minutes. It was actually coined by uh, um, a, a computer scientist. Um, so I guess one of the things that we specialize as an institution is, whoops, trying to, um, trying to address complex, particularly complex topics like molecular biology, network science, and, and, and sustainability science, and other sort of interdisciplinary sciences. Um, one thing that just happened recently, we, we, um, we debuted, I've, I also work in ocean sciences, which I haven't really talked much about, but we debuted a, uh, an NSF report, which we did on the uh, interdisciplinary idea of ocean science. So ocean sciences, which involves everything from fishing to um, um, you know, ocean, ocean acidification. Um, we've actually created a, a uh, 64, well, it's 64 now. By the time we're done, it'll probably be more like a 100-page report on the, the state of, the, of, of uh, ocean education um, and ocean literacy, um, particularly in this country. So it gives you a sense. So you know, we're, 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 we're trying to get our minds around how do we teach interdisciplinary ideas. So um, one of the things that's sort of common among these things is this idea that, uh, that we have to use big data sets because that's the way these global ideas are actually, um, um, that's, this is, that's how they're, they're, they're kept. That's how they're understood. Um, and various ways of visualizing those data are how they're explored. So um, we're looking at, you know, how do you take these, these techniques that are typically used in, at very high level by scientists, and some of them are very individual, they're not commonly used tools, they're new and emerging tools, and how do we teach them to kids, you know? Um, so um, our CEO likes to call this, um, this, this, these kinds of ideas and this sort of initiative that we're involved in, big data for little kids. Um, so what I'd like to talk about, um, just to give you a brief overview of, of what I'm going to talk about, is that um, there's a changing emphasis in the need not just for what we teach about science and about how science is done and helping to close that gap, but also how learning research and practice needs to change to help meet that goal. So one way to get, the, uh, I do my little spiel on 20th century science versus 21st, and this will give you a sense of why we call it the, the, uh, fourth, gen, um, um, the fourth paradigm. So uh, during the 20th century, um, people still considered nature to be much of a vast wilderness. So we had things like telescopes and microscopes would give us little portholes on nature um, and uh, things that are otherwise unseen so we could see the stars in the sky and the microbes and we began making discoveries about things that were already there that we could observe, and that might be called the first paradigm. Um, then we developed models and tried to fit the data 
that we gathered on seeing how well nature functioned as compared to how well we thought it did, um, that might be called the second paradigm. Then we strive for ways to accumulate uh, more and better quality data so we could refine models and gain a more accurate picture of nature and develop more sophisticated ways to simulate things that happen in nature. Um, we might call that the, fourth para uh, the third paradigm, but uh, we were still hungry for data through much of the 20th century. Um, but there was a realization as far back as 1950 that, that that approach that we had to science during much of the 20th century was unsustainable. In the Sixth International Congress on the History of Science, Derek DeSoya Price predicted the exponential growth of science and that doing meaningful science research would become so complex and costly that it would soon, we would soon exhaust our ability as a society to be able to conduct science as an enterprise. Um, the demise of science was palpable and imminent. And that um, sort of stirred a lot of um, discussion about the end of science, you know, uh, where science is headed, how can we sustain science. Um, but toward the end of the 20th century, our ability to acquire data accelerated rapidly, um, largely due to the computer and uh, rapidly changing uh, capacity and speed of computers and the ability to accumulate data from things like small and cheap sensors, um, logging systems, high resolution remote sensing, um, automated shotgun DNA sequencing and protein um, uh, mass spectrometry and things like um, bigger, better, more sensitive particle accelerators. Um, then we created cyber infrastructures to coordinate the storage of these expanding boluses of data. And we're now gathering data at such a fantastic rate we're drowning in it. We no longer have the problem of gathering data, but now we're having the problem of ha being able to analyze it all. So in the 21st century, we transitioned from modeling abstract ideas in nature to managing modeling and making discovery in massive amounts of streaming data and processes we capture from nature. This is what Jim Gray, who from Microsoft, coined the term uh, the fourth paradigm, or e-science. So e-science fundamentally changes uh, the approach to problem solving from an analytic one, which uh, by the, the, the definition of the word means to break apart, into one where you have to emphasize seeking patterns, dynamics, influences, behaviors in whole systems. So here are some statistics that uh, sort of put this in perspective. Um, the number of currently active researchers exceeds the number of researchers ever alive. Some areas of science produce more than 40,000 papers per month. Computer users worldwide generate enough digital data every 15 minutes to fill the Library of Congress. More technical data have been collected in the past year alone than in all previous years since science began. So these kind of sound astonishing, but the reason that they kind of snuck up on us was that we didn't have the ability to, to understand um, um, the dimensions of science until, or the dimensions of how we were gathering data until we had the tools to do it. Um, streaming data and cyber infrastructures turned science into a large-scale collaborative enterprise through database visualization and instrumentation technologies. Understanding ways to format, store, retrieve, and visualize large-scale streaming data are eclipsing the kind of procedural and reductive approaches that were once the hallmarks of science inquiry. So what does this mean for, for learning, since that's the area that I uh, deal with most of the time? Um, we need to improve the visual metaphors for both static and dynamic data types for better seeking patterns in complex data. Since we're no longer reducing things to numbers, we need to seek patterns in large scale data. We need better tools to be able to do that. Um, relational association and juxtaposition of different data types may help to synthesize solutions more effectively than categorizing and homogenizing them, which was the objective of reductive science in the past. And this is something you guys, is core to what you guys do in terms of thinking about, you have social data over here, you have scientific uh, or environmental data over here, um, sometimes they fit together, sometimes they don't. How do, you, how do you figure out how to correlate them? Exploratory skills to plan inductive skills as the role of models change. Um, so finding general patterns and seeking and characterizing behavior of those patterns in different environments is beneficial. So you may find a similar convention. This is particular to network science where we seek um, ways that networks emerge in different um, kinds of um, phenomena uh, from you know, looking at the way uh, protein interactions may be similar to social interactions or the way the growth of the internet might be um, similar in terms of small worlds to the way um, neurons make connections within the brain. So we're now finding ways that these, the, there are sort of rules out there in nature and we're starting to be able to pull them in and apply them to a lot of different kinds of things, but there needs to be, we need to be trained to do that. That doesn't just happen by magic. 
Um, and lear learners need to be encouraged um, and researchers to collaborate across domains and compare and contrast processes and build compatible ontologies. So, you know, in, in, in one word can mean something completely different in every science domain. Not, not even thinking about looking at social science or looking at anth you know, our anthropology or looking at economics or, or looking at uh, medicine, but um, you know, just uh, between biology and chemistry, um, something like an analog can mean something completely different. Um, cyber infrastructures need to make large data sets more available and interoperable, and tools need to make it easier to process and manipulate different data types together and by users at any intellectual level. You know, we, we have a missed opportunity in terms of thinking about um, the use of cyber infrastructures for strictly for research. They need to be able to be used for learning too, and uh, there, are in, there are interests and open source ideas about how uh, these kinds of things can happen that can have little kids uh, uh, work with big data to filter, to seek patterns, to look for their, their, their role and their, their, you know, where they are in their big data. Um, and we need to, um, need to better formalize how to analyze streams and build frameworks that help everyone make sense of them. Um, so th there's going to need to be a partnership among learning policymakers, curriculum specialists, e-scientists, programmers. Um, we need to be able to bring large amounts of data into mashups and display them in different ways to help construct and synthesize knowledge. One of the ways to make discovery in these different data sets and make correlations is to be able to view them in different ways <laughs> and compare them in different ways. And having the ability to, to, uh, to very quickly and easily filter and repre change representations is going to be important. Um, search engines are pretty much obsolete. Um, as much as I admire Google and their new headquarters that they're planning to build, uh, without semantic approaches within and among ontologies, we can't deal with data at this scale. Keywords are just, they're, they're really the stone knives of, uh, of um, um, data handling and filtering. Um, natural language relationships and relational thinking to link data and make discoveries are needed because the silos don't, don't apply anymore. Um, chemistry, biology, physics, um, things don't fit into those silos neatly anymore. There needs to be a way to, um, to, to deal with things the way we think about things, which is through semantic um, networks. So without these basic skills, the gap is widening between the practice of science and the, um, the, edu the teaching of science. So we're, actually, we're not creating a, so a society of decision makers and, and, an, and a workforce that can effectively make sense of large scale data. We're just, we're not doing it. Um, uh, there needs to be, this needs to be considered a, an integral part of how we educate uh, STEM literate citizens. Um, so the problem is that the way that we deliver learning um, needs to be completely rethought. Um, we actually probably need to rethink the way we study learning too. Um, it's been acknowledged that what we call the learning sciences are in crisis. Um, they've been steeped in the linearizing and physicalizing paradigm that's common in, in uh, formal learning environments, while ignoring the complex social and cognitive interactions that actually comprise learning processes. Um, learning is emergent and self-organizing um, as any, um, all the time you spend outside of school learning, it's, it's not formal, it's emergent. And you learn things and you gather things and you remember things based on the way that you're, you're, what you bring to them initially. So you, the, the conditions, your, your pre-existing knowledge is actually brought to bear on whatever, you, whatever your experience is. Um, what we try to understand is stable concepts or components within a learner are really processes and dynamic network systems, yet we continue to conceptualize education as a linear distribution of packets to be stored. Um, and you crack open any textbook and tell me something different. So we're not creating investigative methods and metrics um, for studying learning that help inform how to build effective and testable curricula and resources to, to teach complex science and provide training for the uh, K-20 teachers, essentially, lay people and policymakers. So you know, we, we, have a, a, we have an entire system that's, um, that's broken. The whole atomist, atomistic model of learning, is, it doesn't really work anymore. Um, and here are some, some indicators that uh, I've pulled together that, um, that indicate um, what we need to rethink about STEM learning. So there's the problem of superposition. 
um, and we arrive at ideas that succeed because we assume linearity and, and uh, additivity of learning. Um, this idea that you, you scaffold learning, um, which is used pretty commonly in, in the formal environment, um, doesn't apply to everything. You, things that we think follow because they're more complicated ideas don't necessarily relate to what's underneath. Um, and we don't really know what success means when, we, when we're teaching these things except in the self-validating systems that we use to assess them which are based on the limits of those systems. So we don't really know what the, what the potential is of learning in a formal environment because we've confined learning in very, in very rigid ways. Um, <clears throat> we also don't understand what other possibly adverse effects on conjoining the properties that we do in learning has on the learning system in people because we don't look at learning in networked or holistic terms. Um, the structure of processes and the interconnection of entities embody distributed cognition based on dynamic systems. Um, and if we don't focus on the structure of causality and the processes rather than the distribution of things, we're always going to be limited in terms of how we can teach. Um, learning systems are also, systems are also multi-layered and multi-scaled among individual group, society, and culture. And understanding the dynamics and interscale effects is going to be required to, uh, to develop accurate learning models. Um, causality is reciprocal and mutual in learning systems. So learning is really evolutionary. Um, and actually, people like Gregory Bateson used to, who brought this back, this idea out back in the 60s. But people um, are just now beginning to look at it and realize that you know, learning, the way our brain is structured is around very similar to the way that things evolve in nature. You never start from scratch. You always build on what you already have and vary in, and create variations on what you already have. So we need to think about learning um, in, in, in more evolutionary terms. Um, uh, properties of learning networks include situatedness and distributed cognition. And a network perspective on these things could really help us create a generalizable network theory of education. Um, and also what we think of as fixed images, self-images of scientific theories, are evolving within these systems. Um, Di culture is dynamic. You know what, what Newton said and what Heisenberg say says said are very in, very different. And while some in some ways they overlap, in some ways they work in opposition to each other. So you know how do we reconcile that? We reconcile it by the fact that understanding that science is culture and culture evolves. So <clears throat> here's here's the big the big moment where I put my pitch in for informal science institutions as being the place where, where we should be studying these things. Um, I think we we're, we're, um, we're have an opportunity to be at the forefront of finding ways to research and disseminate practices on e-science teaching and learning and help close the gap between the practice of science and the learning of science um, in formal STEM institutions. And I'm talking primarily about science centers, but there are lots of other in informal learning institutions that could be involved in this as well, art institutions, nature centers. Um, Anywhere where you have, an op have a pool of human subjects <laughs> that you can, uh, you can experiment with um, and, and try these things out and, and figure out what works and what doesn't and then build curriculum around them are opportunities for doing this. Um, so the issue is you know, we have to go back and challenge basically 300 years of, of the scientific process and how we teach it and um, um, find ways to uh, to build meaningful ideas um, in the, in, within the complexity of STEM that's just exploding before our eyes. I mean, we think about what's happened in the past 20 years. 20 years from now, it's, it's not even imaginable. So, um, and this upsets the status quo in overwhelming ways. And I think about uh, Thomas Kuhn's um, book about paradigm shifts and the depressing conclusion that it takes a generation to make a real paradigm shift in, in science discovery because everybody has to die that believed in the old paradigm. Well, I'm hoping that e-science can challenge that notion and maybe, or maybe accelerate it or at least um, find, a, find a way around it. Um, that's that's um, an anecdotal uh, held opinion by myself probably alone. Um, so now I'd like to talk a little bit about what we're doing at the Hall of Science that might fit uh, into attaining that goal plus uh, what might have fit into the work that you guys are doing um, and I think it does, based on the uh, conversations I've had with some of you. Um, so network science, um, 
is the paradigm of analyzing complex systems of interaction through dynamic statistical and spatial relationships. Um, we've been involved with the network science community worldwide for over a decade and developing communities of researchers and educators and projects around educating people in formal and informal environments and uh, determining how best to teach effective e-science skills, particularly to middle and high school kids. Um, so we developed the first public science museum exhibition on network science, um, which um, Cynthia mentioned before, uh, called Connections, the Nature of Networks. And um, we've been using this exhibition as a tool to acquaint millions of visitors to the science of complex networks, um, including doing video teleconferencing with K-12 schools all over the world through what we call our virtual visit program. Um, we cover the basic foundations of complex networks such as clustering, small world, scale-free networks, and emergence, and provide a number of examples from cellular networks to social networks and uh, through a variety of interactive experiences. This one here is called You Are Here, and it actually tracks all the visitors in the gallery, and then when you approach the, the, uh, the screen here, it actually highlights your path throughout the gallery and your interactions with visitors and the exhibitions. Um, we participate and are partly responsible for developing the International Conference on, uh, and School for Network Science. Which, and we've been building collaborations with universities all over the, the world and research labs um, in coming together with ways to bring network science into education. So we started a symposium at the Network Science Conference called NetSci Ed, which is about network science and education. And it's not just teaching people about network science, but also how network science is helping to understand how people learn and the systems of learning. So everything from networks of teachers and how they interact to create effective schools and um, what kinds of programs we could use to teach kids um, and also um, programs that look at informal networks of, of, edu of educators or um, how, how uh, informal learning happens in society. Um, and we sponsored the last one at, the, uh, at the, the conference in Northwestern. We have another one this year, which we've, um, we didn't have any money to do, but decided to do it anyway, because we got so much support from people that were, we don't have to pay to come, <laughs> that we have to go now. So that's in Copenhagen, even though the airfares are crazy right now. Um, and we, um, we've gotten a really enthusiastic response, and we found a guy um, in Hungary who's doing middle school curriculum development on network science. So they, they're going to talk at our, at our uh, symposium. And anybody that's in Copenhagen in the beginning of June, we invite to come to our uh, symposium. Um, we've also developed the first high school program for network science in which we place high school research teams with network science researchers, um, and then they present their work. Um, we did, in 2011, we did it as a competition uh, be because we didn't have very much money, um, and that was a good excuse to do a competition. And we sent the winners to um, teams of network science high school researchers to uh, the uh, International Conference in Budapest, which was a week-long conference. And then they also went to a conference and we, um, in, uh, on complex systems, which was in Boston soon af after that. Um, and then um, we were able to get enough enthusiasm among the program officers and NSF to give us more money after that to do a formal program, which we're doing now in collaboration with Binghamton, SUNY, and also uh, State University of New York in Binghamton, and Boston University. And we've partnered with uh, um, about seven or eight research labs. That we're growing the program year by year, but we're going to be placing 10 teams of students this year in research labs. Um, we've got a lot of support from Columbia University, Harvard Medical School. Um, Boston University has their own research um, that they do. Stevens Institute. Uh, um, City University, so we, we have lots of, uh, of interest in doing this. And the, the students go, they, they put together, um, they do, do research, and then they actually they present their work. The thing that's really neat about this is that they go into these labs and you're thinking, okay, so they're going to get into some research project that that's ongoing, they'll have some role in it, it might even be getting coffee, and then at the end they'll be named in, in a paper with a bunch of other people who are working in the lab. But the, the people in the lab were so, so incredibly enthusiastic about the idea, they let the students come up with their own research projects and then they execute them. 
So we have one team that's actually published in PLOS One uh, a couple of months ago. Um, we have a, a group that's up in Newburgh, New York, that's working with West Point, the U.S. Military Academy, at their Network Science Research Center. And they're, they've gathered, they have a huge high school, and they've gathered tens of thousands of data points that they're, that they're putting together into, uh, into a network analysis of comparing, um, so they're comparing texting to um, commu regular communications within the school. You know, how do ideas percolate through, um, through um, students texting each other or even students texting with teachers versus um, the, the normal channels of communication within the school. <clears throat> Scientometrics is another area um, that we're working pretty extensively in. Um, and there are lots of sort of offshoots of this. So science, scientometrics, or sometimes it's called the science of science, is the process of measuring the scope and dimensions of science research and creating tools for analyzing it. So um, we've been in working with Indiana University over the past uh, seven years in developing ways to improve the understanding of the scope of science in society, excuse me, and the ways that science disciplines relate and connect to one another. Um, it's, this is a decade-long effort. It's actually in its eighth year now. Um, we just, um, we're looking at ways in which science can be visualized and analyzed through a variety of representational schemas and metaphors. And this year, we're actually doing some research with visitors on, on spatial representation and reference systems and what they understand from them. And um, we were talking a little bit earlier about the problem of uh, scientists tend to create these big, complex, bristly ways of visualizing things that they understand but nobody else understands it. So um, we're trying to find out how we can find a middle ground. How do we filter that? How do we layer the data? How do we give people um, some, some inroads into the data? So we're actually getting a sense of what people's understanding of data representation systems is as a baseline for doing that. And that's, that's work we're doing. Actually, we're doing a study the week after next um, at three different science centers, Science Museum of Minnesota, um, or either Koshland or Wonderland, depending on whether one or the other can participate, and then our museum. And we're going to be uh, uh, actually going in and surveying visitors, showing them maps, and, um, and actually trying to figure out so what is the baseline knowledge that our visitorship can, uh, can get from maps, and then use that as a way in to some of the more complex ideas and figure out whether we, do we have to layer, do we have to change representation systems, do we have to uh, change the colors, you know, and there are lots of different uh, sort of factors that we're, we're dealing with, dimensions of reference systems we're dealing with. Um, and um, so just to, to give you insight into this particular thing, for those of you who are not um, assigned to matricians, this map here is, um, is based on the citation indices of millions of scholarly papers. That's, I think it's from ISI, um, the ISI database. Um, and then on the left, there are two time slices. The top one is from 1974, and the bottom one is from 2004, which shows the flow of knowledge in biochemistry. So green is biology, blue is chemistry, light blue is biochemistry, and magenta is bioengineering. Um, so the top image, more knowledge is flowing from biochemistry into other disciplines than from any other. And biochemistry produced more knowledge than it consumed from analytical chemistry, general chemistry, and other disciplines. Um, a significant trend over 30 years shows that the biochemistry and bioengineering areas are moving steadily into chemistry territory and have a large influence on the current knowledge base. So these, are, these pie charts are the proportions of biology, chemistry, um, and um, uh, biochemistry and bioengineering. And these are created by scientists, which is why everybody's giving me these funny looks. <laughs> This is um, uh, the workshop that, uh, that Cynthia alluded to before on um, um, cyber-enabled discovery and innovation. The cyber-enabled discovery and innovation program of NSF. Um, it was, the work was done on their, on their behalf. And it was in, we, the organizers from Yale and Los Alamos and Indiana University and ourselves brought together a bunch of scientists. And we, we um, tried to put together what we thought was a 10-year trajectory on e-science research and education. Um, and we worried down the, we tried to figure out what are the most important areas. And it turned out that because of the particular chemistry of that group, um, biomedicine, ecology, and science policy were what emerged. Um, and there's a white paper at this URL, um, which anybody can get to and download. 
Um, the uh, the high res version, which is for printing, is takes forever. But um, anyway, so um, the idea is that um, these different topics, which you can't read, of course, um, are in the they're in the 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 the, the, um, the report are predicted out. Um, and these, these actually fall into a lot of the same kinds of areas that, um, that you guys are thinking about and working with. How, how, is, how are data represented? Um, how do you build cyber infrastructures that help improve productivity? How do you visualize things? I mean, there are a lot of the kinds of questions that, that we talked about earlier are actually addressed in this. And at the end, there's a nice little appendix where everybody was required to brainstorm and said, okay, so what is, what is, what I, what is your best idea? If you could do a project and you, had, you, you wanted to get funding for it, Put down an idea, formatted like NSF would, so you have an, a summary, um, you know, um, um, broader impacts and uh, um, significant scientific significance. And there's a whole list of them in the back there. Some of which are in various states of being addressed. Other ones which haven't even been touched yet. But it makes you realize there's a whole fertile area of, of not only not only science research but also education, developing of tools, uh, data mining techniques, that kind of thing. Um, so we're, we've been looking at how to, how do you take um, cyber infrastructure and leverage them against some of these, these uh, sort of important ideas in terms of learning um, and give people an incentive to sort of manipulate, filter, and visualize um, complex data and ideally their own data. You know, it would be nice to have a system where a kid could come up and, and plug in, oh, here's, my, here's the data set I'm interested in, here's my Here's my million points, data points on all the people that I've ever encountered on Facebook, um, and I want to I want to see what that looks like, and have t intuitive tools that can that can help them process those kinds of things. Or streaming data, they can pick uh, data that that are refreshed, um, uh, you know, uh, and kept up to date, and visualize them and make discoveries um, in them. So we need to build better tools for for um, and visual metaphors for mining these complex data and help people make discoveries in them. And again, I think this, this applies to everybody, um, not just scientists. Um, so we're working with programmers at Indiana University to develop and test these kinds of systems. Um, in some ways, they resemble gaming more than this, this was one idea, was using a Wii when Wiis were really popular to actually make changes on a big display screen. So anyway, that was one idea. NIH didn't want to fund it. Um, <laughs> So um, the idea is that um, you, you build something like this where people can manipulate these things through these and filter these large data sets through intuitive interfaces and allow them to explore. And we've kind of coined the term after um, uh, Joel Rosnay um, of calling them macroscopes. It doesn't exist yet. And, pl and be plug and play. So the idea is that you can bring in uh, data from uh, different places and plug it in and it, and it has a consistency of the way it's represented and the way you actually uh, mine it. Um, part of the role of, uh, of flipping data and methods um, that the 21st century science does is a need to make um, what we ask of computers be much more sophisticated and better suited to the ways we think. So um, having data access and discovery can now be made um, much more natural in, uh, around the conceptual relationships data sources have with each other and I say conceptual because that's the way we conceive the way that they're organized. Data in the world are organized the way we think about data. There's no separate reality of organization. We organize it. So, um, but we don't um, organize the way that we um, mine data in ways that we organize it. That probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but if you think about, um, we, c we program computers to do things the way computers require us to as opposed to the way we think. So we need to sort of flip that into and do it more in a way that computers start to think the way we do. Um, so part of this uh, <coughs> movement that's just um, in small bits and pieces right now is the cre creation of domain ontologies that can be federated and mined semantically. Um, this, there are really good ontologies, particularly for things like malaria, which are really hard things to, to figure out. So the, between the very complicated life cycle of malaria and the very complex genetic indicators, um, um, they realize that you, through common ways of accessing knowledge and storing it and, 
and analyzing it, we can't get there. We're never going to solve the problem of malaria through um, Google searches. So we need a different way to do that. Um, and the tools actually exist now to develop these kinds of mass ontologies. We just need lots of people and lots of um, sort of new kinds of programs to be able to do it. Um, and STEM learning could be, we could develop mass ontologies for STEM learning too. Um, and they could be outsourced, uh, could be crowdsourced for or basically any developmental level. So imagine, if you will, um, uh, learning ontologies for all of STEM where it's like you're a third grader and so you're accessing data at a third grade level. But then you say, you know, well, I'm, I'm actually a pretty good third grader. I know a lot about STEM, so let me click this up to the, to the fourth grade. Now the entire ontology is now at a, an appropriate fourth grade cognitive level. So that's kind of the, where, we're, where we're trying to head anyway. Um, so semantic networks, the other thing about semantic networks, they support inter interdisciplinarity, um, which is, uh, as you guys know, is so um, necessary to breaking down the silos and, uh, and being able to federate and uh, cross-analyze and correlate data among different domains. Um, so uh, another thing that, that's part of the equation is the need to automate um, the ability to develop semantic relationships. So you, you ideally want algorithms that can actually create triples. Um, and you need really, really, really good metadata to do that. And there are very few um, sources out there of, of metadata that are, are, are really good and very comprehensive. One that's pretty close but it, the project is kind of dying now, is the uh, NSDL. Um, and what's nice about NSDL is, aside from having really, really, really good metadata, their, their core, the uh, Fedora core of their, um, their database, is a semantic core. It's a, it's a triple store. So you could, if you invoked it, they haven't. They're not doing it that way. But if it was invoked that way, the way Cornell intended it to be, you could turn that into a triple store and with the right tools take all that metadata and create uh, an ontology out of it. So we're hoping that we'll get there. Um, um, then, so this is, gets us to some of the, more of the, the current work. Um, one of the most important big data ideas that I can think of is, has to do with sustainability indicators. So these were actually uh, some data that were developed as, as part of an NSF project to figure out what the scope of sustainability science data was. So the way that we define sustainability is the bringing together of disciplines in the natural and social sciences, engineering, and health. Um, and the basis of studying uh, and understanding sustainability trends and resilience of human nature coupled systems is the large scale data and statistics that define environmental, social, and economic parameters for the way humans behave in their environment and the byproducts of those behaviors. So the stuff you guys work on. So this is actually based on a, uh, a AAAS meeting we had four years ago, I think, um, which was actually intended to be a, a, the culmination of this research project to say what is the scope and what is the progress that's happened in sustainability science over the past few years since it's kind of started and where is it headed? So the, the problem when it comes to what we do in our museum is that the data, the trends, the phenomena, the ideas of the large spatial and numerical and temporal scales that um, these um, sustainability indicators ex exist um, are difficult for them to comprehend. Um, you know, even just the mechanics, never mind all the data that they represent. Um, and we've discovered that in, through doing um, focus groups that um, people function in a fairly localized anecdotal space. Um, they don't function in the, the large-scale, complex, and intersecting intellectual spaces that the indicators represent. So I drove my Hummer this morning, and in the climate didn't change. So what does that mean? Th that, that, those kinds of things. Or the weather, it was, it's been a cold winter, and we had a lot of snow, so I guess global warming really isn't a problem, is it? Um, conflating things like weather and climate, because people don't think about things in scale. I mean, this, this goes everything to, down to things like the idea of logarithmic thinking. You know, people think a thousand is, uh, the difference between a hundred and a thousand isn't that different between uh, a million and a billion. 
because they're different, they're different increments, and they think of those increments as being linear and not, you know, and not changing over large scales. So thinking of, well, if a million ping pong balls are put in you know, um, um, you know, some stadium, Custer Bowl or whatever, and I'm probably dating myself, <laughs> um, um, then what would a billion be? And people would probably tell you probably twice as much, even though we know that's a thousand times more. So um, there are very fundamental kinds of problems um, that people bring to these kinds of experiences, and we had to get to the core of that. So we brought in a bunch of uh, learning scientists and talked about it, and they said, you, got, you guys are full of shit. You're never gonna get where you wanna go if you keep this way. You have to think about what are the really core ideas that um, sustainability, these sustainability indicators represent, and the processes, and you know, what you want people to get out of it, and um, then think about what's the very basic piece of learning that goes around, and it turns out that there are systems ideas that, he, that we don't think about, they're not intuitive, and we, that you have to apply to these various intersecting systems in order to understand them, but nobody gets that because they're not taught it and it's not intuitive. So we, um, we're hoping that we can turn this, uh, this, these ideas not just into a, um, an exhibit that people can attend, but also a learning lab. So we can teach things like balance feedback loops and causal chains and uh, give people an, a, a better sort of intuitive sense of how to apply these to to thinking about, this will make sense in a minute, um, their experience in the exhibit. So we're developing this new exhibition in this uh, 8,000 square foot space. This is our great hall over here. Oh, you, oh, you can see my cursor, okay. Um, and um, we're actually building into it this, uh, we're calling it Connected Worlds, uh, and it's about sustainability science. And the goal is to provide the visitor with an understanding of their place in large scale data by giving them tools to filter and visualize data and find ways to make the leap from local day-to-day -day experience to the trends that normally associated with sustainability indicators. So we ended up assembling, aside from the learning science folks that we brought in with a little bit after the fact, um, this uh, Columbia Center for Earth Science Information Network, uh, the CSUN guys I talked about earlier, uh, NYU's Game for, for Learning Institute, and uh, some, guy, some guys from the Harvard Program for Evolutionary Dynamics to look at cooperation research um, because we not only want to know what people get out of this um, in terms of understanding but what can they do with it um, so this is going to be um, um, ideally in, in our dreams a, uh, a an experience that invites visitors into the realm of big data systems and sustainability and it consists of a series of virtual environments which provide visitors insights into how different ecosystems respond to their decisions and actions about how they modify the land and the resources. So the different uh, environments are connect, uh, the connected worlds are united with stocks and flows of water. So you can see here, this is sort of dia a diagrammatic representation. And here we actually have the places where the water flows. And these, this is based on a uh, composite model of um, a water system, an urban water system. Whoops, I did it again. An urban water system actually based around largely around the New York City water system because it's, it's kind of unique in some ways. Um, it's, it's the largest gravity-fed water system in the world and um, it exists solely because, in the way it exists, solely because of the, the way that the land around it has been conserved going back to the 1800s. So. so visitors have the opportunity to manipulate the flow of water among and between and within these different, uh, these different environments. And the things that live there then respond to that. So uh, we'll put together, and we, we made a decision to not do direct representation of actual environments because we wanna be able to have the ability to manipulate the visitor's um, experience toward these core ideas and not have them be distracted by too much reality. Um, what was it the, that's the saying they had in the 60s? Reality is just a crutch for people who can't handle their drugs. So the idea is that we create this sort of fantastical environment where it, it doesn't link or couple directly into real environments. And then we can play with, um, we can, if we want to make the water purple to represent contamination or changes in flow or put arrows in or you know, whatever we want to do, we can do to, to help um, take the individual's experience and help them make those those, those uh, connections 
within those systems or among those systems. Um, and that was a deliberate decision. Um, it also makes it more playful. So we can invite in little kids too, just to have fun, even though they won't get, and we know for a fact they won't get the system stuff. They can't get the system stuff, which is okay, but they'll have fun and their siblings will be off, you know, watching things happen and things respond, so. Um, and to, um, to give a, a sort of a better, like or sort of reinforce the systems view, we, we've, we've created this thing, we call it a global uh, node that allows the, um, the large scale dynamics of the space to be able to be diagram diagrammatically represented. Um, we're not sure how that's gonna happen yet. It's gonna depend on some of the research we're doing around what kinds of representations of dynamics are best suited to highlighting certain kinds of um, phenomena and interactions. Um, I call it an up button. If this could be conceived of as similar to that macroscope idea so that this is actually the whole space. These are the different environments. So you, so you can see things are moving diagrammatically, not necessarily directly representing, but it, close enough so that people can say, oh yeah, that's that flock of birds that went over here because the desert flooded and they can't burrow in the cactus any, you know, whatever it is. Um, and then there'll also be games because of the, the, this idea. We really want to know, know something about cooperation research um, and how people, what gets people to cooperate uh, and do the right thing? What gets them to defect? Because uh, there are always going to be people who are going to break it. You know, they want to break it. They come in and they say, well, what if I just kill everything? You know, but, but uh, killing things has consequences. So you can build into the system ways to, to understand what actually happens. So when the when the Lorax is is watching the uh, the the, um, the 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 pond get all full of, uh, of of toxic waste from the factory, and the, the humming fish can't hum, you know they're they're sad now, you know. So um, whatever ways you can provide feedback to the audience to, to know the consequences of what they're doing and how that feeds back into the changes that happen in the environment. Um, so the games will do something similar to that, only it'll be group activities. So there'll be people that. And we actually did some prototyping, very complicated prototyping, that um, we found that people take on, naturally take on roles. And partly it depends on age group, but it partly depends on what needs to be done in different um, locations. So if we have all these different um, people, and they'll, they may work in teams or they may work individually to solve some kind of problem, but they'll naturally fall into certain kinds of roles. And, the, and, that, and those roles, help create almost, it's almost like a little mini learning community. And w through multiple iterations of the game, they, they come to understand not just how to solve a problem, how to break a system, or you know, whatever the, the, the goal is, but they also learn that there are, there are ways to, co to cooperate. And we can learn by observing what those ways are, and then apply them to other kinds of circumstances like community action, because we're also doing um, projects that involve these sort of community action um, uh, kinds of um, things around climate change, everything from bud bursts to sampling um, carbon monoxide in their communities. And you know, we, uh, our museum is located in a, a part of Queens called Asthma Alley. And the reason for that is because there's a, a huge power plant over here, LaGuardia Airport's over here, it's traversed by all these highways. Um, you know, there, there's, there, there are train, two different train lines that come through it. You know, it's a, it's, a major, um, it's a major hub of transportation. And then there'll also be other parts of the experience that help reinforce things um, that they learn in the, the, the sort of the big experience. It'll give them additional depth, um, show them wh what kinds of scientific models are actually being used. Because we, you know, when, when we go through all this effort to create these, these water models, it's great to be able to show people how they actually work um, in real life um, through various kinds of stories and data visualization. Um, so the, the idea is not just um, a, a public experience, but also um, sort of a learning lab. We can, we can teach people at various dimensions and depths, but we can also investigate how they learn. Um, and as we're putting a, a pretty sophisticated tracking system in there, um, at this point it looks like RFID. We're hoping that we don't have to use that, but that's where we're, we're headed. Um, and also gestural interactions that are tracked by a computer. So everything's logged, and we can actually use those, those data um, up against the, uh, the changes that happen and how people respond to it and look at those things overall. And then, as I, as I mentioned, how do we extend this outside into the real world so people can sort of scale 
they're they're known that now that they know that they they have a, the ability to affect things. How do they start to perceive their their real environment, their communities, uh, their attitudes toward climate change, the community that they may become part of as as a result of this? Um, and then beyond this, um, we're also working in um, in this idea of uh, sustainability and re resilience research and education, in particular in urban environments. Um, this is. This all happened partly because of uh, the post-Sandy reality of what New York City is like now um, and how attitudes have changed. But there's an opportunity to, uh, there's a window, we believe, that we can get a better understanding of how people learn and respond to, uh, to, to uh, um, issues around major disasters and start to think about adaptivity of, of populations and their perceptions of how they adapt. Um, and so we're, we're working on this, this sort of initiative, we're calling it Learning Cities, which is uh, how our initial discussion with Cynthia started. Um, and the social learning impacts and the capacity for urban uh, ecosystems to adapt. And we're also involved in a project, which we don't really know where it's headed yet, but then they don't either, um, to build a science and resilience center in Jamaica Bay as part of a uh, large national urban park. Um, and we would be responsible for the, all the education that goes on around that. But ideally, a lot of learning research around how we educate people. And Jamaica Bay is a really good example um, of, of an urban setting that, uh, that is, is, has a, a, a significant natural component, but is under incredible pressure from everything from Kennedy Airport to um, the trains to uh, the sea to um, um, you know, urban effluent that comes to it uh, and a nearby dump that's been capped. I mean, they're, they're a, it's, a, it's a really good laboratory for that kind of thing.